Good morning. Let's stand and worship together. Jesus is 
Amen. You may be seated. So good to see everyone this morning as we worship the Lord together and just be reminded that the Lord never fails. Uh, Just this morning in Sunday school, we're talking about how so many times the people in the Old Testament and New Testament just fall so short of the standard that God set for him. Yet God is always faithful and true to come through and he never fails in the midst of our failures. So so just be reminded of that this morning. Uh, Whether you've had a great week or an awful week, the Lord is here for you and he will succeed in bringing his kingdom come and his will be done. So just just remember that. A couple announcements this morning. Uh, anyone know what two Wednesdays from now is? Valentine's Day. Someone said it. That is true. So guys, don't forget, Valentine's Day is two Wednesdays from now. That also happens to be the beginning of Lent. So Lent is a very old historic Christian tradition where it's the 40 days leading up to celebration of Easter and Resurrection Sunday. It's a time of preparing our hearts, minds, and souls to celebrate uh, Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And so it's a very historic thing where people often will fast from something. Uh, It could be chocolate. It could be sports. It could be whatever it is. Uh, And so just we encourage you just to be thinking thinking and praying leading up to Lent uh, two Wednesdays from now. Is there something that God is asking you to go without for the 40 days leading up to Easter to help your heart and mind be set on him? And so just be thinking and praying about that. We just want to make sure you are reminded of that. Also, towards the end of this month, the 24th at 6 p.m., that's a Saturday, we're going to be doing Bible trivia. And so we've been talking about it. We're going to do men versus women at 6 p.m. We're going to have spaghetti and some salad. Uh, We encourage everyone who comes as a family just to bring a dessert so you can share that with people. It's going to be a ton of fun. Now, just to get you into the mindset of Bible trivia, I have a question for you this morning. And because I am a youth pastor, I always have a spare candy bar ready. And so the first person who can tell me where Jesus was arrested can get this candy bar. Garden of Gethsemane. Who said it? (laughs) Right here. Here we go. So everyone give it up. So some questions will be easier than that. Some questions will be harder than that. Uh, But we just encourage you to spend some time getting ready for Bible trivia. Uh, Bring your family, bring yourself, invite some friends to it. It's going to be a great time. So make sure you come to Bible trivia. Other thing that we've got coming up on March 1st through 3rd is for high school girls. The Table Rock Wesleyan camps are starting retreats for guys and girls. The guys is going to be at the end of September. But the girls retreat is March 1st through 3rd. It's 100 bucks. We encourage you, if you're a 6th through 12th grade girl, come talk to me. Go to Table Rock Camp com. Sign up for it. It's going to be a really, really cool thing to be part of the first ever girls retreat at Table Rock. Uh, two other things. One, April 13th, we just want to get you on this radar. The men's ministry, they're going to go paintballing on the 13th. We're going to meet at 9 a.m. at Bojangles. Uh, it's, so if you don't want to go to paintball, but you want to still fellowship with other men of the church, you can go to breakfast beforehand and then not go paintball. But we're trying to get 24, 25 uh, men from the church to sign up to go because then we can get basically the course to our Ourself and we can have, uh, you know, it'll be a lot of fun to do that together. And so talk to Ronnie, Greg, Eli about that uh, so we can make sure we can reserve that for the men of the church. And again, teenagers, guys, you're welcome to come to that as well. So that's April 13th uh, for that. And then lastly, April 14th, the day after that, that Sunday, we're going to have our annual church conference. Once a year, we just have uh, our business meeting of the church. We elect different leaders of the church. And so we encourage you, that service is going to be a one service Sunday, so we won't have our 9 a.m. service. Uh, we'll still have Sunday school, and then we'll have the 11 a.m. service. And then afterwards, we'll have lunch provided for you. So come to that. Lunch is for everyone. Anyone is welcome to attend the annual conference. And so we encourage you to see more of what our church is about, to attend it, Only members will be able to vote that day, but we encourage everyone to be a part of that process on the 14th. But that's all the announcements we have. Let's pray and keep praising the Lord this morning. Jesus, I just pray this morning that we can truly seek you out um, because we know that you will answer, that you will show up, that you will be there for us, and that you will never fail like we sang in that first song. May that be each and every one of our hearts to truly seek you this morning. More so than we come to be in a nice building or to see family or friends, God, I pray that our hearts will be seeking you in spirit and in truth, that we will desire and long to meet with the one true God, the God of the universe, the living God, who willingly laid down his life on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And so we pray for that this morning. And we just ask that it's not just us gather, but Holy Spirit, meet with us. Come and fall, come in, not just into this room, but into our very hearts, into our very souls. And so we just ask, Lord, any sin that we need to repent of this morning, may we repent of that so we can truly meet with the fullness of you this morning. 
God, we pray that you will anoint the worship team as they lead us uh, with their instruments, with their voices, uh, so that all of us can be one voice as a church crying out to you, Jesus, lifting up your name for the goodness of who you are and all that you've done in years gone by, what you're doing today and what you're going to do in the future. And God, we do pray for Pastor James when he preaches that you will help him to uh, boldly declare your word that you have shared with him through the scriptures to encourage us and challenge us as a church. God, we don't want to be a church who just meets and shows up time after time, week after week, and nothing happens. God, we want to be a church that is transformed by the word of God. We want to be a people who looks like you call us to be and not who just looks like everyone else in the world. God, we don't want to be special and unique in our own right, but we want to be set apart for you and for your purpose and for your glory so that people can see our good works and glorify you in heaven. So that's what we asked for this morning. We asked for you to accomplish that because no amount of beautiful music, no amount of compelling preaching can bring true transformation. It is an act of God. And so we ask you, God, to bring true impact into our lives so that out of the overflow of what you're doing in our lives this morning, that we can impact our families, our friends, our schools, our, our offices, our community, and ultimately our world, God. And so we just submit ourselves to you right now, and we ask for you to be here and leading and guiding us in worship. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Stand and worship with us.
Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to be here and to worship you. And Lord, we humbly ask that you would speak to our hearts today as we gather for prayer and scripture reading and singing. And and God, I hope that that is the cry of all of our hearts, that we truly do love you. And we acknowledge what you've done for us and the price you paid and how much we are truly indebted to you. So, Father, as we gather, I pray that you would help us and teach us and shape us and mold us to be pleasing to you. That, God, we don't just simply ask that what we do would be pleasing, but, God, that you would show us what is truly pleasing to you. Father, help us to just come humbly before your throne this morning to acknowledge that, that none of us in this room, none of us who are watching or may listen to this later on, that we, none of us are complete. None of us have been perfected. Lord, we all have growing to do. We all have maturing to do. And God, that's why we come. We come humbly before you today because we acknowledge how much we truly need you in our lives, how much we need to grow, how much we need to mature. And I pray that you'd help us to do that today. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters who aren't able to be here. Lord, for all the ones who have been struggling with some health issues for a long time, we pray for them. For people with sicknesses and different situations in life, God, we lift them up to you today. And uh, God, we just ask that you would work and move in only ways that you can. We love you. This is your time. And I pray that we would tune in on you. We would drown the rest of the world out this morning. And we would focus on your glory and your honor. We love you and ask it all in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. As always, it's great to see you. We are winding down in our uh, series on fasting and prayer. And in the midst of this, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things. And, you know, a few weeks ago, I, I told you that we, we have to be careful not to just constantly have this agenda when we come before the Lord, whether it's just simply in prayer or if it's in fasting and prayer, that we're not just coming to him every time we go to the Lord, that we're not asking for something or we need something, but actually we acknowledge God for who he is, for what he's deserving of, and we love him and we're pursuing him and we desire a relationship with him. That's really important in our lives. And so as, as we move forward and we talk about fasting and prayer, we're, we're focusing on a little different things this morning because everything that we've talked about so far, if you pursue fasting and prayer in our previous messages, have been really specifically things to kind of benefit you or help you in your life or in your relationship with the Lord. But today we're talking about intercession. Fasting and praying for intercession. And what that means is you are doing this on behalf of other people, whether or not they know it, whether or not they know that they need it, whether or not they've specifically asked you to intercede for them. But there's a calling and a need in our life to, to really fast and pray in a way that is interceding on behalf of someone else that we go to the Lord for them. And as we talk about this today, I just want to go ahead and mention this and say this before you kind of tune out, because some of you are in here saying, look, fasting and praying isn't particularly something that I am even willing to do for myself, much willing to do for anyone else. Well, let me challenge you by just going ahead and starting off and saying that if you are committed to fasting and praying on behalf of someone else, there's really not a whole lot in life that you can do that's more Christ-like than interceding on someone else's behalf. If you want to say that you're a Christian this morning, that you believe in God's Word, that you trust in Jesus Christ, and you, you claim to be a believer, you're called to be like Christ. And there's nothing more Christ-like that you can do than to deny yourself things of the world in order for someone else to benefit from that. That's exactly what Christ did with his entire life. 
And so as we read our passage this morning, we're we're looking back at the Old Testament again. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to start with verse 3, and then we're going to skip to verses 18 through 23, okay? So let's read this together, Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. And as Daniel uh, says, he said, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. So Daniel, just kind of give you an idea, Daniel's pretty old at this time, late 70s, early 80s. They've been in Babylon in in what's approaching to be almost 70 years, the time's coming. Daniel has read from the prophet Jeremiah that they were supposed to spend 70 years in exile, and then after that 70 years, they would be able to return back to Jerusalem and, and go back and live in the promised land that God had given them. So, excuse me, he has read this, He realizes that this time is coming, and now he has committed himself to fasting and praying and and devoted himself on behalf of his people, Israel. Because think about this. Daniel is, like I said, upper 70s, maybe early 80s. He's not making the 750-mile trip that lasts four months. He's in Babylon till the day he dies. So when he's seeking the Lord, he's not doing this so that he can go back to Jerusalem and see the, the promised land one last time and, and experience that for himself. No, he's seeking the Lord and fasting in prayer because he knows that there's a nation of people who belong to God who need to be in the land that God has given them, living underneath God's authority and able to serve him as God has commanded them to do so. And so he's fasting and praying so that other people will benefit from what he's choosing to give up. You understand that today? All right, so let's skip to verse 18. Daniel continues on. Oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. You need to take note of how Daniel's approaching the Lord in this. We're going to talk more about it later. In verse 19, he says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay. O my God, for your people and your city, bear your name. In verse 20, he goes on to say, I went on praying and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I am here to tell you what it was. For you are very precious to God, so listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. So point number one I want us to see this morning is, is that as we are approaching our Father, and we're trying to do that in a way where we're not just coming to Him with an agenda. You remember we compared it to kind of like teenage kids, and this is no offense to teenagers. I was a teenager. I've done this, and I'm sure that I still do this, even as a a late 30-year-old that you know, sometimes your parents don't necessarily feel like you want anything to do with them until you want something from them. And that can be kind of annoying. And we have to be really careful not to do that with God. So in an effort not to come across and present yourself in a way that could be annoying to our Father, because if we love Him, if we acknowledge Him, and we acknowledge what the sacrifice that Christ made for us, there should be a difference in the way that we approach God than just only coming to Him when we need something. So point number one is, you have to acknowledge the truth, okay? And Daniel does an amazing job of this, because Daniel acknowledges that he and the people of Israel do not deserve anything. You with me this morning? They acknowledge, God, I don't deserve anything. The people of Israel don't deserve anything. And and he says in verse 18, we make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. And a lot of times I think we as people, we approach God with this attitude of, okay, God, I gave this up for you. I committed to following you. 
You know, I, you know, you you asked me to do this, and I've done this, and I've played ball, and I, I've I've done, you know, pretty much everything. I'm not perfect, but I've done a lot to try to get, you know, do what you've asked me to do. And God, I, I just feel like I, I need you to do this. And so we just kind of like make this plea of all the things that we've done, and kind of why we deserve what we're asking for. And we have to be really careful that as we approach God that we're not trying to convince Him of what we deserve, because in truth, you and I deserve nothing. And Daniel realizes that. And I think it's pretty fair to say that when you read about Daniel, uh, in the book of Daniel, he's one of the best examples of a faithful follower of God that we have. You don't really read anything negative about him. And he's very faithful for 70, you know, we get 70 years of his life from a young man as he goes into Babylon till he's an old man, that he's continually faithful, he's continuing honoring God whether it's like the littlest things with, with prayer or big things or, or you know just seeking the Lord, honoring God, and from the change of the Babylonians to the Persians to the Medes, and, and as these kingdoms and these empires are changing, as kings are changing and rulers, it's like the script just constantly gets flipped and he's continually faithful and he continues to face. And even you know when you read Daniel in the lion's den, he's like 80 years old when he gets thrown in the pit. You don't think about that because all the children's books puts him as this young like, kid being thrown in the lines. Of, he's an old man. And you know, it would be a lot of us, if we were in that, it's like, God, I've served you faithfully my whole life. Why are you going to let me get thrown in a den of lines? Like, we would be frustrated with that. But Daniel faithfully serves God over and over again. And he comes to the Lord in the midst of this. And he's praying. He's like, God, we don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything. The people don't deserve anything. We're coming to you because of your mercy. And as we approach God, especially on behalf of someone else, because this morning you may have someone in mind, as we talk about fasting and prayer for intercession of someone, if you're pleading on someone's behalf, and you may already have someone in your, on your mind, on your heart right now, that you know, I probably need to do that for them. Like they're in a position, a situation in life where they need someone to cry out to God for them whether it's for a spiritual issue, a physical issue, because people have all kinds of things in their life where they, they, they need the Lord, they need God to intervene, but they're beaten down physically, emotionally, spiritually, and it doesn't matter whether they're saved or not, because many of you can think of a time where you were extremely close to the Lord and you feel like, like you were filled with the Spirit and you felt like your relationship with God was amazing at that moment, and right now, maybe you just feel like, oh, I'm, I'm drained, man. I'm empty right now. I don't have anything. And you can't really put your finger on it. You can't say why, but you just feel it and you know it. So whether or not somebody knows it or they don't know it, there's somebody in your life that you could be interceding for right now. But as you approach the Lord, your God, and, and you know, I always think about parents interceding on their child's behalf, because that's probably going to be one of the things you lean towards. I will tell you, no matter how much you love that little rascal, they don't deserve anything. Okay, so when you plead on it, like, don't come to the Lord and say, oh, but they're such a good kid, and they have a good heart, and blah, blah, blah. No, like, they're, we're all sinners. We're all evil. We're prone to sin. We've all rebelled. We've all fallen short. Jesus Christ died to save us all from our sins. We are in debt to him for all of eternity for the price that he paid for our eternal souls. We deserve nothing. But thank God that he's merciful. And thank God that he's willing. Thank God that he made a way 2,000 years ago to make sure that everyone could come to him could be rescued, could be saved, could have eternal life, could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And because of God's mercy, we can approach His throne, not because we deserve it, but because God is merciful. And Daniel, who was extremely faithful, one of those people who probably could have said, God, you know I've, I've served you faithfully for 70 years now. I've given everything to you. My life's been put on the line multiple times. I've been threatened with death, been thrown in the lines then. You know, it's, it's just kind of like... God, you got to hear me on this one, man. Like, I, I deserve this. So many times we as people, we come to the Lord with this attitude of, of when we approach Him that we, we kind of deserve what it is that we're about to ask for. And the truth is, we don't deserve anything. When you look at Jesus, we claim to be followers of Christ. We, can't, we claim to believe in Him and trust in His love and mercy. We claim to believe in His Word. You look at what Jesus got in his life. He got death, 
punishment. He got rebellion. He got betrayed. He got abandoned. And we all know the suffering and death that he endured on the cross. And when you think about that, if that's what Jesus got, and we claim to be followers of Christ, and Scripture says that if you want to live with Christ, then you have to die with him as well. If you want to be my follower, you've got to take up your cross, and you've got to follow me. Now think about that. So if you sit here this morning, and you start coming to the Lord, and you're saying, Lord, I, you, if we try to claim what we deserve, in fact, we deserve everything that Christ got. And so if you ask for what you deserve, I think we would be pretty fearful of what we would actually get. Because we all deserve what Christ got. But instead, he's merciful. So he pleaded on behalf of God's mercy. So point number one, we acknowledge truth. Point number two, I think it's important that you got to deal with the sin. It's really interesting here that you look at Daniel and you look at his life, and you look at how great he represented the Lord in so many different venues, and yet as he's approaching God, he's acknowledging his own sin as well as the sin of all of God's people. And it's no secret that we're all sinners, right? We're all sinners, okay? I am a sinner, And as sinners, you and I have a nature within us that's prone to sin. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you because, you know, Christians get a bad rap because there are some people who try to act very holy and very apart from sin and try to put on a good show and things like that. But the truth is, is that we're all sinners, And everybody knows it, God knows it, you should know it, and know it about yourself. And even though you may be sitting here this morning, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and right now, your relationship with Christ may be better right now today than it's ever been in your entire life, and you feel strong in the Lord, and you feel like God is speaking and working and moving through you, you still need to acknowledge that you are a sinner. And that there's a nature within you that is prone to sin. And it's very common, and it's something that everyone deals with. And it's not just something that you deal with as an individual, but it's something that we deal with as groups of believers. And when you read the New Testament, so much of what the epistles was writing about, or the the apostles were writing in their epistles, was that you had all these people that were still struggling with sin. They had received Christ, but yet they're still struggling with things of the world. And you have Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, where Paul's writing to the church in Galatia. And he's addressing this issue of sin that's still like they're dealing with this and they don't exactly know how to handle it because they've been saved, they've been baptized, they've been filled with the Spirit, and yet they're still struggling with sin. And so Paul writes and he says, the sinful nature wants to do evil. There's something in you that will desire evil. And for each person that looks very different, some of you may be more, more prone to one thing than another, but we all have something in us, and it could be anger, it could be lying, it could be like still, you know, whatever. You just name a vast array of sins, and each of us are drawn to different things. That nature pulls at us. But he says, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So you can be filled with the Spirit and living for the Lord, and yet there is something within you that is still fighting for for sin and things of the world. And those, those two natures are clashing because as we are filled with the Spirit, we want to serve God, we love the Lord, we have this revelation of what Christ has done for us. We acknowledge the debt that we owe, and we're trying to live for Him, and we feel empowered at times with the Spirit, like we're inconquerable in moments. And yet, like that, temptation presents itself. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're living a life full of sin, or you're committing habitual sin, but it could just be that man, like, you know, at work the other day, somebody made you mad and you lost it, and maybe you sinned in something you said, or a thought that you had, or you didn't guard your, your, uh, your purity in a moment. Or, you know, it's like, whatever. Whatever it is. Maybe, you know, somebody made you mad, cut you off on the road, and you sent them a signal that wasn't Christ-like. 
But we have moments where the flesh comes out and it presents itself in us, even though we are filled with the Spirit. You've got to be aware of that. And Paul says these two forces are constantly fighting against each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. So you have to deal with the sin. And this morning I encourage you as believers that as you are fasting and praying, whether it be for your own needs or whether you're interceding on someone else's behalf, I want to encourage you and remind you today that if there is sin in your life, you are not going to have the complete access to God that you need in order to see God working and moving in your life to the full potential. If there's sin in your life, whether it's one sin or lots of sin, or maybe it's even sin that you don't know. And that's why King David wrote in the Psalms, or, or yes, Psalms, where he said, Lord, forgive me if there's any sin in my heart that I'm unaware of. Reveal it to me so that I can repent of it and be united with you fully. And so for us as believers to, to not be so conceited in ourselves or in our walk or even in our feeling of the Spirit in times to forget that we are still sinners and there could be sin in our life. There might be sin in our life. And if there is, we need to address it and deal with it. We need to address the sin that's in the people's life that we're interceding for. Because I'm going to tell you, as, as important as the physical is. If you have somebody in your life who's dealing with physical issues and you want to pray and fast and, and intercede on their behalf, the sin that's in their life is much more important than the physical ailment that they're dealing with. If you believe in Scripture, if you believe what you say that you believe about God and you claim to be a Christian, then you have to acknowledge that the sin in their life is more important to be dealt with than the physical issue at hand. Right? Everyone that was brought back to life in the Bible, they still died. Every sickness and disease that was healed, those people, they still died. Every one of them had to face a Father in heaven who judged them and granted them access to eternal life or eternal death. The spiritual is so much more significant than the physical. And so we have to address the sin. Got to deal with the sin first. Point number three, nothing is more Christ-like than intercession. I said that a while ago, but I want to say it again. I want to make sure you write it down and get that. Nothing is more Christ-like than intercession. When you look at what Daniel is doing here, and he's pleading and crying out on behalf of the people of Israel, he's not doing it for himself. He's doing it because he believes in God he believes in the nation of Israel that God has set up. He believes in the people that God has chosen. Daniel understands that the Messiah, God's son, is going to be brought forth through Israel and that most of his ministry is going to take place in Jerusalem and around Judea and in Nazareth. Daniel understands like what's at stake here. And he knows that it's bigger than him, no matter whether he ever gets to see it or he ever goes back. He knows that God has a plan and he's interceding on behalf of someone else. And Daniel is fasting and he's praying. And even as an elderly man, he's giving up things of the world so that the people of Israel, who probably don't even know that he's praying for them right now, can benefit from his prayers and his intercession. There's nothing more Christ-like than that. So much we love to focus on Jesus dying on the cross. But the sacrifice that Jesus made is so much more than just that last few days of his life. It encompasses his entire life from birth to death. When you look at Jesus and you look at his life... He denied himself everything in this world that you and I hold valuable and that you and I have at some point pursued. He never had a family of his own other than his mother and father. He never pursued a relationship with another woman. When you look at the majority of people 
one of the first things that kids start doing before they even have the ability to pay to go on a date. They're looking for a relationship with someone, right? They're looking for love. And Jesus denies himself of that his entire life. He never has a spouse. He never has kids. He never has a family of his own. He never has a home. He moves around from place to place, accepting the hospitality of other people to bring him in and to care for him in different times where he's at in ministry. The two things that we probably love the most in our lives, our families and our home, he denied himself of those two things. He never had wealth. He denied himself of that. He didn't handle the money. He left that to someone else. Even though Judas, he knew Judas was still in the money, he still, he left it to Judas. He never handled money, never had excess money for himself. He never had fame. And that's kind of a weird statement because you think, oh, he was one of the most popular people of the day. In some regards, he was. But when you look at Jesus' fame, I mean, it was this idea of people came to him because they always wanted something. It was kind of that annoying teenager mentality. Hey, my kid's sick. Hey, this is going on. Hey, I have this. Can you do this for me? Blah, blah, blah. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And there's all these things that that these people were pursuing Jesus for, and it wasn't because they believed in him and they loved him. Very few people believed in Jesus and trusted in him. The Gospel of John says, despite all the miracles he did, yet few people believed. You read the story of the ten lepers. He heals ten people. Only one actually comes back and thanks him for what he did. People got what they wanted from him, and boom. And then there were times where these great crowds begin to follow Jesus, and every time great crowds begin to follow him, guess what he did? He squashed it. He chose to put an end to it before it got started because he would say something difficult. And then everyone would get frustrated, and he would turn the crowds away. And they would leave, and they would abandon him because they didn't like what he was saying. They didn't understand Jesus denied himself of everything. Even when you look at the temptation of Christ as he's in the wilderness, he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He denies himself basic things that all of us would desire, that we would want. His whole life was about denying himself from things of the world so that he could be that perfect sacrifice of the cross. His life had to be a sacrifice in order for him to qualify to be on that cross. And so for us as believers this morning, one of the most Christ-like things you can do is to take the time to fast and pray on behalf of somebody else because you're denying yourself from things of the world that you could gain, that you could enjoy, that you could partake in so that someone else can benefit of it and you're not the one that benefits. There's nothing more Christ-like than that. Point number four, we'll be done. Intercession should be a reciprocating act among Christians. And that's really important for you to understand today because we need this in our lives. We need this in our walk with Christ. We need this in our church. We need this in all churches. We need this in all Christianity. But fasting and praying and interceding on each other's behalf should be something not that you're just expecting some elderly person or saint of the church or, or a pastoral staff member to do on your behalf. Like, oh, well, that's, that's them. They'll fast and pray. They'll intercede. We'll trust them to do it. Because the truth is this morning, um, and I shared earlier in the first service, like there's very few people in, in this world that I know that if I went to them and said, hey, I got this going on, I just want to let you know, will you pray about this? And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that person, they're going to hit their hands and knees and they're going to start praying and they're not going to stop until there's an answer from the Lord. Like They're committed to it. Whenever they say, yes, I'm in, I'm in. Because even I know and I understand how hard it is to do that. Because I told you guys, prayer is not my strength. And if you come up and you give me a prayer request, and and most of the time you'll see me, let me send myself an email, and I'll send myself an email to remind myself of the prayer request, get it on the prayer list so I can remember to pray for it. Because if I don't, it's, I'm ADHD, you say it to me, I forget it by the time I walk away and talk to the next person. 
So I got to remember. And, and so a lot of times we'll try to pray. And you may say, yeah, I'll pray for you. And then you say, yeah. And, and then you pray in that moment and you pr- say a short prayer and then you never think about it again. Because I've been guilty of that. But as people, we have to be committed to praying for one another and interceding on each other's behalf. And there's an amazing story in Esther. You can turn to chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. We're going to read this. Most of you are probably familiar with it. A lot of women have really uh, fell in love with the book of Esther here lately. There's been a book written with it, and, and so it's been a popular Bible study among women. But let's read this, these three verses, and then I'll give you a, a fill-in on what's going on. So Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him to do. So if you're unfamiliar with the story of Esther, let me give you a short story version of what's going on. Haman is the most powerful uh, official in the kingdom of Persia next to King Xerxes himself. And Haman walks around and he has this rule or this law that everyone has to bow down to him, but Mordecai refuses to bow down. So Haman hates Mordecai and he hates all the Jews because Mordecai is a Jew. So Haman comes up with this plan that I'm going to get rid of all the Jewish people and I'm going to get rid of Mordecai because Mordecai is a pretty popular person during this time. But he, he kind of slides it in under the rug a little bit. We're going to get rid of all the Jews. They, they pose a threat. And he takes this to Xerxes, smooth talks Xerxes. He signs the bill. They pass it through. And so on this certain day in, in the entire empire of Persia, we're going to wipe out all the Jews. Genocide. Okay? Mordecai finds out. He goes to his cousin Esther who is now the new queen, he says, look, this is what Haman's done. You need to go to the king and you need to intercede on your people's behalf because you're a Jew too and this could affect your life. But the problem is, is that if you go to the king, Xerxes, without being uh, invited, uh, it's a pretty big gamble. And so the, the rule was, is if you came before the king and he didn't, re- didn't want to see you, and you offended him, or you got on his nerves, he would just kill you. And apparently that was a pretty popular thing. Like that happened more times than not. Because he really liked Esther, and yet Esther was super nervous to go before the Lord, or go before the king. So she calls all the Jews and says, hey, y'all fast and pray for me for three days and nights. I'm going to do this too, and then I'll go before the king, and I'll plead my, and if I die, I'll die. That's where we're at. But the cool thing about this story is, is that you need to understand there, there's a give and take in this moment. Esther's going to intercede on behalf of the people of Israel to King Xerxes. And the people of Israel are going before the Lord and they're interceding on behalf of Esther so that this is accomplished. And what we don't realize a lot of times is how important it is that we as Christians that we are lifting one another up in prayer, that we're interceding on each other's behalf, because the truth is, is that, that we need that. that there, there's that giving relationship between Esther and the people of Israel, and they're both willing to do it because they both understand, if you do this for me, I'm going to benefit, so I'm going to do it for you so that you can benefit, and that's the reciprocating act of it, where we're giving this back and forth to one another. And the truth is, as Christians, we have a hard time with this especially in our culture, because we, we've said it time and time again, we have a hard time just fasting and praying for our own prayers and needs because we don't like giving up stuff. Like We're just so used to just doing what we want. It's really hard for us to take a step back, deny ourselves the things of the world so that we can focus on spiritual things. And we're very reluctant to do it for ourselves. So why in the world will we be doing it for our fellow believers if we're not going to do it for ourselves? But the truth is, is that you need it. You need it. You know, we we forget a lot of times that as people, that we're vessels. And God keeps bringing me back to this. That that we're all vessels. We're, We're meant to be 
poured into. We're meant to carry something. And there's two reasons why <clears throat> that plays into us interceding on each other's behalf. Number one, even though we're vessels, we're leaky vessels. Like, you and I were created to be poured into and to hold something, but at the same time, you were never intended to hold something permanently. God created you in a way for you to be poured into. The ideal version of that is, is for Him to pour into you spiritually, for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, to have that relationship. That is the healthiest way to be poured into. But at the same time, like you think about it, like we're, you know we're designed to be poured into because everybody who has a hole in their life and they're empty, guess what they do? They fill it with something. Whether it's food or drugs or relationships or whatever it is, if we're missing something in our life, if there's a hole in our life, we find something to fill it with because we're vessels. And it doesn't matter what you fill it with, whether it's things of the world or it's spiritual things, it always runs out. Any of you ever think of a time where you were really close to the Lord spiritually and you feel like your relationship with God was better than it's ever been and then later on you felt like it's not as good as it used to be and I don't feel as close to the Lord as I used to be. Anybody think of a time like that? All right. We're leaky vessels. It happens with spiritual things and you know it happens with physical things because as soon as you eat, guess what happens? You're still hungry. As soon as you drink, you're still thirsty. That's why Jesus said, I can give you water and bread that you never thirst, you never hunger again. And so we're called to be vessels. We're, we were created to be filled with something, but we're leaky. You were never meant to hold something permanently. There's nothing in this life that you could ever have or gain that you're going to keep permanently. You always run out. So you need to be refilled constantly. And the truth is, sometimes we don't even have it within ourselves to seek the Lord. Now, I think I said this in a church letter you know, a few weeks ago. I was so sick. You think that I was, I was running a 103 fever and feeling like I got ran over by a bus? Everything you think I was on my hands and knees praying during that time? Like, mm-mm. It was the last thing on my mind. I was just like, I hope I don't die today. And hopefully, and I truly believe that there were people who were praying for me during that time because I needed that. I was unable to do it for myself. And you could be emotionally, physically, mentally at a point in your life where you can't do it and you need someone to do it for you. <clears throat> so this takes us to the second reason. Because as vessels, you weren't created to hold stuff, but you were created to transfer stuff. Like, like you're, you're kind of like a bucket that has some cracks in it and if you sit that bucket there and you come back tomorrow it's going to be empty because it's going to leak out but it works good enough where if you need to take like four and a half gallons of water you could take four and a half gallons of water but not five because it's leaking as you go but you you're made to transfer you're made to transfer stuff and, and that's applicable in anything in our life you think about it if you're sick what do you do you give it to people right now how many of you have ever been sick and made somebody else sick we did that. We played that game a couple weeks ago. If you got a disease, like you have the, the ability to transmit the disease. If you're negative, you can transmit your negativity to people. You know somebody like that? If you're positive, you can transmit the positivity. So it's like, you think about it. There's people that you can be around, and it's a pure joy to just be around them. Like you're just like, man, that was great. I feel energized. Like there's a wonderful person to be around. And then there's somebody else you be around. You come out of that and you're just like, I'm so drained. It's like you didn't offer to pour yourself into them. They just sucked everything out of you. <laughs> you're meant to transfer. Like it's whether you realize it or not, as people, we are reciprocating stuff constantly in relationships in friendships, in the church. And it's so important for us to understand this morning that as you're a vessel and as you're meant to be poured into by the Lord continuously, you're also meant to pour into other people and intercede on their behalf. People need you. 
and you need other believers. This is one of the biggest things that we miss as Christians is we try to do Christianity in America where it's just like, this is me. My relationship with God's personal. I don't like when people infringe on this and ask me questions because that makes me uncomfortable. It's like, no, you're wrong. If you can't talk about your relationship with Christ, there is something wrong. If you can't get excited about what Christ has done for you, there's something wrong. I'm not saying you have to get up in front of a room like I'm doing right now and do that. That's not everybody's calling. But if you can't sit down with an individual and have a conversation about your relationship with Jesus Christ, there is a problem. Because you should be excited about your relationship with Christ. You should be able to talk about that and verbalize what it is that Jesus has done for you. Every one of us should be able to do that. When you look this morning, you think about, <clears throat> there's no doubt that God created us to benefit from one another. Christianity is not a one-person show. It's not something that you just get to do on your own. There's a reason why Jesus trained his disciples, told them to go out, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth and place Peter as the head of the church. There's a reason why Jesus did that. The church is here for you and I to benefit from one another, to pour into one another. I want to tell you this morning, man, I don't know about y'all, but how awesome would it be to leave this room today and know that there's going to be someone here who's going to fast this week they're going to give up something in their life and they're going to spend the time that they would normally do indulging in that thing or partaking of that thing. They're going to spend that time praying for you this week. How humbling and yet encouraging would that be to know that someone was willing to do that for you? And the sad thing is, is most of us is like, I don't know if anyone would do that for me. That's really sad. But as believers, we're called to love one another, to care for one another, to pour into one another, and to intercede for one another. And today, if you know, we said a while ago, there's probably somebody on your heart and mind right now that you know is like, that's the person I need to be interceding for. I want to encourage you to pray for them, to intercede for them fast on their behalf, not because they deserve it, but because they need it. And God is merciful, and God answers prayer. And if you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I don't know who to fast and pray for, look around this room and you pick someone. Pick somebody in this room that, that you can fast and pray for this week and spend the next six days denying yourself of something in the world to intercede on that person's behalf. And when you come in next week, pick someone else and fast something different. You can fast the same thing if you want to, but I think fasting something different is always good too. Change it up. That way you don't get burned out doing it. But fast and pray for each other's needs because the truth is we all need that. I don't know about y'all, but it would, it would be like one of the most humbling and yet encouraging things to know that if we went home this week that I had someone specifically fasting and praying for me. It's like that's... That's humbling. We need to be humbled. We need to be brought down the notch every once in a while and realize how much we need someone praying for us. Because I don't know about y'all, I need people praying for me. And whether you realize it or not, you need people praying for you. But it's reciprocating. Okay? There's a need in our life, and you have to trust and believe that as you are faithful to fast and pray for someone else, to trust and believe that God's going to put it on someone else's heart, to fast and pray and intercede on your behalf as well. And we got to trust in that. That's what the body of Christ is for. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for another wonderful day, for the opportunity to come and read your word. Thank you for just so many wonderful examples of people in Scripture who are faithful to deny themselves and cry out to you for various reasons and for other people who didn't even know it. Jesus, help us today to sacrifice ourselves for your glory and your kingdom. 
Lord, when we pray for others, it's really for you. You're the one who receives the glory and the honor. And I pray, God, that you would give us the heart to be humble and submissive, to realize this is something that should be a regular part of our lives. We love you and thank you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.